the power to eliminate all of us. And learning that the all-powerful J. Edgar Hoover was related to her was only part of Millie's mysterious family secret. The rest involved close relationships forged in the dark generations ago. Sexual relationships that complicated current relationships on her family tree. Passionate pairings from the past leading to a practice called passing for white that was much more prevalent across the country than anyone ever realized. Passing, as I remember as a kid, is that when you were a black individual, African-American person that had very fair skin, blue eyes or green eyes, pretty straight hair. You could say I'm black or I am white. A passing is a term usually for a very, very light person like myself, a light person who feels that they're going to be hemmed back or kept back because of their nationality, their race or whatever else, and they want to better, better themselves. So it's easy to say, well, I'm the one that's being recognized as being well, the legitimate race at the time, and say, okay, I passed it, I'm part, I'm part of that group. And on Millie's mother's side, many of the relatives were light-skinned. When I would go out to school to see how my children were coming along, and my kids would and they introduced us to the teachers. The teachers were white, and they told my daughter, said, she's not black. I said, what am I now? In fact, the higher up the family tree you travel, the whiter the leaves look. When I saw my grandmother, and when she left, that was back in the halls and booger days, where they, that's the only kind of transportation they had. And uh, when, he, when they left, I said, Dad, I said, she's just as white as any of the rest of the white people. I asked questions. A lot of my people pass for white. I believe that in my heart. But that's their desire. And I believe when it happened, if I had been born, I would have passed for white. And I love my, being a black woman. I do. But in 1893, I'd have jumped through the back door and come out the front white in a heartbeat. Back in the days of slavery and the many years of economic oppression that followed, it's understandable why it was done. Yet passing for white was ultimately a deception, a lie. And if the truth can set you free, Millie sure needed to find it. I'm hurting so bad inside because all these years I've had this dream. And I know in my heart and in my subconscious mind it meant something. But I was afraid to say it, but I knew. Oh yeah, I knew. And when I found it and I saw it, I began to feel free. Everything just moved off of me. It was just like uncovering a veil off my face. And I was anew. And I know that my husband can see it, my mother can see it. You know what my mother said to me? She said, daughter, I've never said this to any one of my children. She said, but you are the chosen one. She said, you are the chosen one. I said, mother, why me? She said, I should have always known it because out of all my children, you were the most nosy one. Millie's path to wholeness had begun with her writing and it continued in conversations with her mother. So when I talked to my mother, she, she started talking about uh, the Hoovers. And then I asked her, does, does a man named J. Edgar Hoover ring a bell to you? And she was like, shh, shh, you can't tell that. You can't tell, there's two murders, two murders. And I'm trying to follow her. What has the two murders got to do with Big Daddy telling me this old goat was his second cousin? But Big Daddy also told me we could all be killed as we sleep. And I'm thinking, well, I didn't tell it. All these years, I didn't tell it, so why is two murders? Who was murdered? And my mother started to tell me that it was a family secret and an example made in the family. My mother said, are you sitting down? And I said, okay, I'm sitting down, what is it? She said, Ken just told me that Uncle Ivy, her grandfather, was J. Edgar Hoover's biological father. And I said, what do you mean? But actually, she said, outside child, was Uncle Ivy's outside child, because Uncle Ivy was married. 
So I sort of explained outside child to me because I, I think I knew because I heard it back in the South, but I asked her to explain anyway. She said that meant that Uncle Ivy had a wife and he had a, a mistress as well. And he got the mistress pregnant and the mistress had the baby. And J. Edgar Hoover was not Millie's grandfather's second cousin. He was actually his first cousin because just like any uncle, Uncle Ivy was Big Daddy's father's brother. For Ivory and Big Daddy's father, William, were blood brothers, even though they had two different last names, Allen and Hoover, which made the task of untangling Ivy from the family tree even more difficult. The unraveling began in 1990 when Millie first entered therapy. By 1996, with her repressed memories recovered, Millie set out to record her oral family history in a book called J. Edgar Hoover, Passing for White? Question mark. The book was eventually completed and published in 2000, which was no small feat, considering Millie had graduated from the all-black Berglund High School in Macomb, Mississippi, illiterate. When I started to write this book, it was about my family, but it turned out to be much bigger than that. Years of resolute research and doggedly determined digging, Millie was finally able to confirm her family's connection to J. Edgar Hoover. Ivy Hoover is here. It was a tireless task she started in Salt Lake City, where the world's largest collection of genealogical material is preserved. With hard work and hired help from a couple of genealogists, Millie set out to document her family's oral history. First thing, we have that, that, that oral history, which I think needs to be really carefully looked at. Especially in black families, where there was so much illiteracy, oral history is a very important part of our black family history. Um, you can't discount it, you have to take it, take it and then work with it, but black oral family history, you know, Alex Haley showed the importance of this in his work, black oral family history is very, very important, uh, much more than in white genealogy. It took a long time before historians decided to accept oral history as being factual because now you can document through documents of the slave owner in a formal record that was actually verbally given to somebody years ago. And it can match them up and say they are the same. African American traditional oral history is very important, just as important as documents. So I went on a mission when I finally realized that I had a chance to do genealogy on my family because I want to move back to what my grandfather said yes. when I went to him and I said, why? Would he try to hide who he is? I said, Big Daddy, we could find his birth records. Big Daddy looked at me and he said, look, daughter, you won't find it. You could go looking all you want, you will not find it. He said, because it's already erased. He said, he's gotten rid of it. He's already getting rid of who we are in the connection with him. My grandfather told me, and what I'm saying, why I'm telling you that is because when I went looking, I found that. I found exactly what my grandfather told me. We found documents that was erased, smeared, changed. I decided that this one document proves that my grandfather's oral history matches a document. The first anomaly in Hoover's birth record was that it wasn't even filed until September of 1938 when he was 43 years old. By then, he'd held the top spot at the FBI for 14 years, yet he'd never applied for or filed a birth certificate, even though they're a prerequisite to being hired by the FBI. The process was fairly simple. We filled out an application, sat back, and waited for the FBI to do complete background investigation. As far as I know, everybody, or every FBI agent had a birth certificate recorded properly, and you could go there and check it out. So why did Hoover wait until 1938 to finally obtain his birth certificate? Could it have been because his mother died in February of that same year? And after her death, Hoover's older brother Dickerson signed before a notary that he was present and 15 years old at the time of J. Edgar Hoover's home birth. It would seem that Hoover's mother, rather than his teenaged brother, would have made a far better witness to his birth. And Hoover's own autobiographical account states that he was born at home in Washington, D.C. with a physician named Dr. Mallon in attendance. 
However, despite the fact that it was legally required to report a birth to the health department and that this had been done for the first two children born in 